Good morning, good morning, and welcome, welcome, welcome. If you are joining me for the very first time, my name is Dahlia, and I have been sharing the wonderful Word of God on this channel. On this channel, if you are new, I post on Mondays, which we are in the wonderful book of John, and you don't want to miss it. We are getting ready to go into chapter 14, and that is the chapter. That chapter is like the center, the starring part. You gotta tune into that chapter, and we're going to pick up there on next Monday, um, chapter 14. We're finishing up chapter 13. And then on Friday, which is today, it's prayer time Friday. And we are in the series, How to Fast. Yes. Oh, hallelujah. How to Fast. It's going to be a series I'm going to talk about how long to fast, why we fast, purpose in fasting, what did God have to say about fasting, what did Jesus have to say about fasting. I'm going to talk about the different types of fast because people sometimes think that, you know, they can drink smoothies all day long and call that a fast. No, honey, that's not a fast, a real fast. But again, I'm going to give you some disclaimers because there are people who do take medicine who do have medical issues with, with situations like that, you want to consult your doctor just to make sure that whatever medicine you are on, if you're going on a fast, what type of fast is best for you. But again, we're going from the biblical view of fasting. Again, you have to govern yourself accordingly. And like I always say, study, study it out. I'm giving you you know, like a little bit of rice and potatoes, but you got to go and dig deeper and, and, and research it and study what I've shared and study it again and you will get more. Last week, we talked about, we started out with the first module. We started out, what is fasting? Uh, why why we fast? How often? We talk about the that you have to fast with a purpose. You have to fast with a purpose. You don't just get up and fast and you don't pray. We also shared that fasting is joined to prayer. Fasting and prayer goes hand in hand. You cannot fast and not pray because the whole point of fasting is for you to get more in prayer. So never go on a fast and not pray. You have got to pray because we said fasting was the fuel or the power behind your prayer. So fasting and prayer becomes the dynamic duo. It's like a superpower. So when you fast, make sure you set aside some time to pray. Prayer is important. That's the reason you fast because you want that fuel behind. And today we are going to, we talk about how often you fast. We mentioned that Jesus, when he was getting ready to be crucified and to go away, he said to the disciples, when I'm here, you don't have to fast because what? His presence, he was physically, spiritually present with them. And he said, but when I go away, that's when I want you to fast. When I've gone on, Jesus have gone on. We are here. We are still his disciples. We are an extension of Jesus. So this is the time that we should fast. And a lot of those, you know, churches, some churches, they don't teach on fasting. They don't promote fasting because everybody just wants material things and, you know, this and that. And everybody's focused on what they look like and Church has become the epicenter for entertainment. If you go into some churches, you don't even know what it is because they're focused on entertainment and the wow factor because they want to get more people and crowd. But fasting is important and fasting is still relevant. And so we talk that Jesus says, when I'm gone away, that's when you should fast and pray. And so we talked about that. So today's series, we're going to talk about fasting in the old testament you're going to see how fasting is that superpower oh dynamic duo when you want deliverance you're going to see in this old testament and remember the old testament was an example for us the Bible said in the New Testament that the Old Testament was like a schoolmaster or a school teacher for us to learn from you see that? We learn from it because there are things that God was telling them that he wanted the Israelites to do, but they were so uh, abstinent. They were so, they would refuse God. They were stubborn. I don't know what it is, but they were just so focused on sinfulness and 
everything that's not like God, you see. But God has a plan and his plan will never be overturned because if you don't disobey him because of our actions. So it's important that you obey God and you anchor yourself through prayer and fasting. And again, remember, if you take any kind of medication, check with your doctor to see how best you can manage the fast and pray. Ask the Holy Spirit. He will guide you how to carry out your fast. But we're going to get into that later because I'm breaking it down. I'm breaking it a series and I'm going to get to all of it. So stay till the end of the series and you'll see all your questions will be answered. So today we're going to talk about fasting in the Old Testament and fasting in the New Testament. And I want to start out with, remember we said you have to have a, you have to fast with a purpose. You have to fast with a purpose. What is it you want God to do? What is it you're believing for? Remember we said that fasting purposes are to get direction, deliverance, healing. You want power. You want, you know, you want God to come into your situation. And I said this, fasting is not to get God to change his mind. You know, or you want somebody's husband, you know, you, you can't do that. You can't fast to check God to change his mind or change his will. God is the same today, yesterday, and forevermore. Notice how uh, the, the uh, writer quotes it. God is the same today, yesterday, and forevermore. He doesn't change. When we fast, we are killing our flesh. We are mortifying. We're subduing this flesh because our flesh, which is our soul and our body, doesn't want anything to do with God. When you kneel down to pray, everything goes through your mind but praying. You know, and these are the days when people will call and say, you know, I need prayer. I need prayer. You've got to pray sincerely for them. There is nothing worse than when someone asks you to pray and you said, I'm praying for you. Or you hear people, you know, somebody gets bad news and they're giving their condolences and they go, we're praying for you. And then they walk away and they don't pray. That's not nice. That's not nice because when you tell somebody that you're praying for them, they could be depending on that prayer to comfort, to anchor, to deliver them. And you promise to pray and you walk away, not because you're being mean or vindictive, but the flesh is weak. The flesh wants nothing to do with God. So though you meant it, by the time you get home, your body says, I'm tired. Oh Lord, bless them. Amen. That's not really praying for them. You wouldn't want somebody to pray for you like that if you got bad news from the doctor, would you, right? So we're going to get into the Old Testament. Remember, always fast with a purpose. Go back to the first message. I said fasting is for cleansing. You know, people want to cleanse themselves. In the Old Testament, they would cleanse themselves. The atonement, they would cleanse themselves spiritually and emotionally. They would fast to God for reconciliation. We'll talk about that. When they're seeking God for help, they want God to help them. Oh, mighty God. We're going to get into that today. So the first book I want to talk about, we read this the last time, and I'll just elaborate a little bit more. Joel chapter 2 and Jonah chapter 3. In Jonah chapter 3, the Bible said that the Lord sent Jonah, the prophet, to the city with a message. Jonah was a prophet. And God sent him with a message and he did not want to go because the people of Nineveh, they were evil. I mean, they would do child sacrifices. They were in so much sin. They were it's almost like Sodom and Gomorrah. Anything goes in Nineveh. I mean, they were wicked, wicked, and they were against God. And so God sends a message and says, listen, I'm going to destroy you from the least to the greatest. I'm going to destroy you. And so, but Jonah knew God. You see, this is why I encourage you to pray. And I encourage you to get into the study. Come join me on Mondays through the book of uh, John. Because Jonah knew God. And when you have a prayer life, you will get to know God and understand the will of God. And even when you don't, when you pray, he will give you the understanding. And Jonah knew that, that if the people repent, because he didn't like those people. He didn't like them because they were wicked. They would kill 
steal, do all kinds of things. And so Jonah really wanted them dead. And Jonah said to God, I'm not going because if I go, I know you. This is him talking to God. He said, if I go, I know you, God, you're going to have mercy on them if they repent. Jonah is just like us. Think about it. If there was some murderer, some pilferer, some pedophile, and God tell you, go minister to them, pray for them, that they might be healed and delivered, you're going to be like, he killed somebody, or he did this. I don't want to pray for him. He should die. That's the attitude. And so God, you know, had to strong arm Jonah because with God, you have to obey. It's obey or, you know, God is going to get at you. And so when Jonah went to them and Jonah said, listen, God is coming for you. You better repent because God is going to destroy you. The people as wicked as they were, they decided to repent. And so how did they repent and become reconciled to God? They went on a fast. So in chapter 3, verse 5, we talked about this a little bit. It says, so the people of Nineveh believed God and they proclaimed a fast. So they believed the message that Jonas brought to them through God. And so they proclaimed a fast and they put on sackcloth. Remember we talked about sackcloth. You know, it's unattractive. It's like a mourning outfit. You know how like we wear black to funerals because we're mourning and you put the black, the widow will put the black mesh over her face. Well, the sackcloth is similar to something of a mourning garment, unattractive, plain, bland, because they were, they were getting before God and breaking down their their body and their mind and so they put on sackcloth and they went on a fast from the least from the least which meant the children had to fast to the greatest and god god had mercy on them jonah wasn't happy about it because he was angry at god he said see i knew you was gonna you wasn't gonna do what you say you wasn't gonna destroy them you made me look like a fool oh but sometimes you've got to be a fool for god because i'd rather be a fool for god for uh, than a fool for other people out there in the world right and so the fasting brought their deliverance. It saved their life, but it reconciled them to God. Fasting and praying. And so Joel 2, 12 was the same thing. But I want to get to a story, a very popular story. And you're going to see that fasting is like a superpower. But you see, a lot of Christians, they don't know the word. They don't study the word. That's why I'm doing the series so you can understand. And you're going to see from this story how fasting is a dynamic duo with prayer. But you see, as you pray and as you study the word, you're going to see you have to know the word. You got to get to know God through prayer because you're going to see. Let me just get into, I'm going to give you two scriptures. I think I'm going to give you this one first. All right. So we're going to go to Second Chronicles. And this story is about a king named Jehoshaphat. And Jehoshaphat was a great king because in his early parts, um, in his early uh, reign, he began to garner wealth, began to garner wealth. And he was spreading, oh my goodness, you know, flourishing. And so the other nations noticed and they, become, they became jealous of him. And so they were like, wow, he's getting great. He's just spreading himself, you know. And so he grew so much and wealthy and just a smart king. So in order for the nations to overcome him, they couldn't overcome him individual as an individual nation. So they joined alliance. They joined forces and they decided that we're going to take him down because he's getting too big. He's getting bigger than us. And soon he's going to like rule over us. So in order to defeat him and wipe him out, they had to join alliance, join forces. And so word came to Jehoshaphat that, listen, all of those nations have joined alliance. They joined forces and they're going to attack you. They're coming for you. And he got scared like any other king because why? He has his subject. He has his people. And so he was like, oh, uh -uh, this I, 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 I'm, I'm going to like fall like, you know, mashed potatoes in their hands. Like they're going to annihilate me. So this is what he does. So the story picks up in 2 Chronicles chapter 20. And I'm going to start at verse 3. This is after he heard the news. And the Bible says, And Jehoshaphat feared 
and he set himself to seek the Lord. And he proclaimed a fast throughout all of Judah. And he stood in the congregation of Judah and Jerusalem and the house of the Lord. And then he began to pray. Now here is where I want to talk to you because he prayed. But he didn't just pray any prayer of, oh God, save us, we're drowning, oh. He went back to the word of God and the promises of God. This is why I keep encouraging you to study the word because when you know God promise in your life, you can take that promise and pray it back to God. He said, Art thou not the God who drove out the inhabitants before the people of Israel that dwelt here? And you said to us, if when evil come upon you, the sword or judgment or pestilence, if you stand before this house and in my presence for my name, and you cry there unto me in your affliction, then I will hear and I will help you. So Jehoshaphat went back into the promises of God and he said, but wait a minute, God, you promise us that if trouble comes upon us, whether it's a judgment, a sword or any kind of pestilence like disease and pandemic, he says, you promise that if we should turn our face. You see, because he told them back then, if they would face the, the Jerusalem, if they would face the temple, and if they would pray towards the temple, God says he will hear them and he will help them. So he went on a fast. He proclaimed a fast throughout the nation and everybody had to fast. And then when they fast, they prayed and the king started the prayer line and he prayed. And the Bible said that after he prayed, the spirit of the Lord came upon Jehaziel and he began, God begins to speak through this young man. And the Bible said that in verse, um, let's see, verse 15. And he said, hearken ye all of Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the king Jehoshaphat. So God is now answering. And he said, the Lord, thus saith the Lord, be not dismayed, be not afraid by reason of this great multitude. So God was like, yes, it's a great multitude. He said, don't be afraid for this battle is not yours, but it's mine. Tomorrow go down to them. Behold, they will come up on the side of the cliff called Zaza. Now watch this. God did not only just hear them, God is answering them and God now is giving them the location and the secret place where the enemy is going to come at them. So God busted up the enemy's plan by revealing it to them. And he said, you shall need not fight in this battle. Set yourselves and stand still and see the salvation of the Lord your God. He said, fear not, be, neither be thou dismayed. In other words, don't be destroyed. Don't be, dis, don't be so um, bent out of shape that you collapse. Don't collapse. Don't faint. He said, because tomorrow I will go out against them because I will be with you. And the Bible said that. The Lord set up ambushment and ambushment and they ended up fighting each other. So those little nation, when they came to fight Jehoshaphat, God just set up an ambush. God tricked them. And so they turned on each other. Look at that. That's what you call a superpower. He went on a fast and then he prayed. And the fasting and the prayer, and he prayed the promises of God. And God came in and God says, all right. This fight is not your fight. It's my fight. And many times we are fighting fights that God should fight for us. We let our flesh get in the way. And that's why I say when you fast, you bring your, your flesh, your body under subjection, your mind, so that you can hear the voice of the everlasting God. And when they went on the fast, the spirit of the Lord came on Jehaziel and he begins to speak and prophesy and encourage the people to say, you're not going to lose this battle because God is going to fight this battle for you. And had they not gone a fast and proclaim a fast and pray, how would they know what to do? How would they know what to do? So fasting is that fuel or power that coupled with prayer becomes a superpower and God will then enter in and help you and deliver you. So fasting will bring your deliverance. 
Fasting will bring your deliverance. Now, let me make it clear. I'm going to get in some things with fasting. I'm going to get into the do's and the don'ts. Because you see, a lot of people, they think that they can commit sin and live all kinds of way and then jump on a fast bandwagon and suddenly everything's going to be erased. God doesn't play with sin. God doesn't play with pride. But I'm going to get to those lessons. I'm telling you the power behind fasting. Fasting in the Old Testament, they would fast when they needed God to come right away. When they needed God's help, when they needed to repent, they knew what to do. They break down that body, honey, because they want to hear from God. God. And God delivered them. And those enemies that came up against Jehoshaphat, they killed each other. And guess what happened? Then God told Jehoshaphat and the people of Judah, now go pick up all of the spoil, pick up all of their wealth. Because those ding dong people, they traveled with their wealth, their gold, their silver, all of their expensive stuff. They traveled with it. And God said to the king, go and pick up all the wealth. So that made him even more wealthier. Can you imagine? That's our God for you. The next one I want to talk about in the Old Testament is in the book of Daniel. You cannot talk about fasting and prayer without talking about Daniel. We talked about the Daniel fast because a lot of church people, they grab the Daniel fast and they, oh, you know, a diet plan. It's not a diet plan to lose weight. Daniel fasted with a purpose. He did not want to sin against God. And if you look at the modern church today, they sin against God every five seconds. And then they go, let's go on the Daniel fast. God cannot honor that because you're doing it in sin. Remember Galatians. I want you to put this scripture up on your desk, on your refrigerator. It says, be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that will he reap. You can't mock God and God won't be deceived because the world is watching. So you can't indulge in sin and in iniquity and then come to God and fast and pray and think he's going to turn it around. No, sir. No, ma'am. You've got to get right. You've got to do that. Jonah, proclaim a fast, repent and repent. But, but I'm going to teach on that. But I just want to put that in there because sometimes people take one lesson and they run with it, you know. <clears throat> and so Daniel went on the fast and the purpose was not to defile himself with the king's table. Because they ate all kinds of rubbish. He wasn't going to defile his, defile his body. It doesn't mean that meat is bad. It just meant that they offered it to idol. They did all kinds of crazy. All kinds of crazy. And they ate all kinds of crazy stuff. I remember when I was little, my uncle, he traveled the world and he would tell us people ate cat eyes. I was like, ew, I was like a little girl. I was like, no. And I had a cat too. He said, yes. And they, they ate alligator tail and frogs. Now I did learn in school that the French people, they ate frogs, frog legs. You know, that was like a thing. And so I would squirm and he would tell us all these things that we would squirm. So think about it. When you go to certain countries, you're not going to eat what they eat because you're like, that's like an insect where I live. People eat bugs and all these things. So can you imagine they were taken into captivity, exile, like slavery. And then they wanted them to eat their food. And he said, no, I'm not going to defile. God gave them specific instructions on what to eat. So Daniel was obeying God. And if the church people would obey God by staying away from sin, living holy, treating each other right, loving each other. Remember last week on the last lesson, I think I told you. I went to church and some lady was acting shady because she thinks she's so high and mighty. And she did it again. I walked over, remember last lesson, I don't know if what lesson, and I said to you, you know, she, she, you know, people purposely do things and they act like they don't know what they're doing. I know she does it on purpose because you can discern it. It's staring you into the face. They can pretend like they're being nice, but when you have the spirit of God in you, you can discern what people are doing, their ulterior motives. And so I, the Lord said, don't allow someone else's poison to change you. And then you get an attitude and get into malice and, and, and strife. So you go. And tell her you love her. You go. Set, tell her hi. You go and greet her and love on her and mean it. So I had to set aside my pride and I did, right? The woman came back this Sunday, today. I'm recording to um, the message today. And she came back 
and did the same thing again. So this is me. I'm human like you. I, I put my hands up and I started praying. I said, Lord, I'm done. I said, Lord, I'm done. I obeyed you. And this woman came back and did the same thing. I don't know if she's trying to get a rise out of me or the devil is using her or God is teaching me something. And so after the service was just about almost over, she was lingering right in front of me in the area. And I just didn't say nothing because I said, I'm done. I'm not going to jump up, greet you. What are you like? It's almost like this condescending elite elitist attitude. So someone was talking to me and we were talking and she overhears a conversation. And I said, oh, thank you so much. You're so nice. I said, you know, I'm new here. And um, we were talking about something and I said, I'm new to the department. And thank you so much for welcoming me. And she goes, what? I didn't welcome you. And in the middle of the service, let me tell you, we had to exit the service and find a conference room and hash it out. And I let her have it this time. I said, because you're rude. I said, you're rude. It's not offended, but you're rude. So now either you repent or we can decide to be at peace and part ways because I'm not going to tolerate this offensive behavior because it's offensive. And, you know, it went back and forth and I was just like, all right, praise the Lord. I'm good. You're good. We're good. Peace. And two other elders were there. Can you imagine in church? People come to church and they want God to move in their lives and yet they walk around and they do things and they, do, they, they willfully commit sin and then they pretend like they don't know what they've done to you. See, people like that I don't need in my life because if you do something wrong, if I do something wrong, I have to apologize. I cannot sleep because the Holy Spirit convict me and I have to either apologize or fix it. So don't be like that person. If you, if you did wrong to somebody, accept your part, own your part and repent. God will forgive you. He's not going to hold it over your head. Once you say you're sorry and you truly mean it, then God will wash it away. But the problem is people just try to mull over it. But the Bible said, be not deceived. God won't be mocked. He sees you. He knows the intent of your heart. And so they fasted, they prayed the word of God, they reminded God of his promise, and God delivered Jehoshaphat. Here comes Daniel, and he was like, I'm not going to defile myself with your food. And so the Bible said now, in uh, Daniel chapter 6, let's go to chapter 6, and Daniel was a praying man, watch this, they were jealous of him. All the other governors and princes were jealous because Daniel had the favor of the king because of his belief in God and because the king saw the wonder working God in his life. Why did the king see that? Because Daniel was a praying and a fasting man. And it says in Daniel chapter 6 verse 10, just to tell you a little bit about Daniel, it says, now, when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, so what these governors and princes did, they wanted to get him out of the way. So they tricked the king into signing a decree that if anybody over the next couple of weeks pray to any other God and make a request other than coming to the king, that the king should kill them. This is how wicked they and evil they were so the king didn't know what they were talking about you know this is why you got to pray for leaders because sometimes you have wicked people around the leaders like our presidents and and mayors and they kind of tell them stuff and if they're not paying attention and they got a thousand things on their desk they will sign some stupid stuff and then later on realize oops did i do that you know like a urkel moment the king signed it. He had no idea. So when Daniel heard, Daniel, it didn't faze him. It says now when he heard that they, they signed the paper, he went into his house and his windows were open and, and he looked towards Jerusalem, just like Jehoshaphat did. He kneeled upon his knees three times a day and he prayed and he gave thanks to God as he did before. So he didn't let that phase him. He, he didn't let it stop him. He prayed three times a day. 
Now, if you know anything about Daniel, you will see that in every part of his life, the power of God would manifest. There were miracles that were wrought in the life of Daniel because he prayed all the time, three times a day. And he also fasted because he did not defile himself. And every time he would pray, the power of God would annihilate every situation that he would come across. God would give him revelation of dreams and visions that the king would have and so that's why the king liked him so when they threw him in the lion's den because this was the reason they threw him in the lion's den because he was praying fasting and praying and the bible said god stepped in because guess what the king knew about daniel and the king said daniel that god you pray to may your god deliver you from the lions now listen this is a pagan king this is a king who worship idols and the king said to him may your god the ever-living god that you pray to deliver you from the lion he had to keep his word because these were the kings of the assyria when they write a law and they sign it it cannot be reversed they threw him in the lion's den and the bible said god just shut the mouths of the lion now look at that god will shut the mouth of your enemy if you will stop arguing with your enemy and i gotta do that too stop arguing with this woman and go on a fast and pray and god will shut the mouths of your enemies on that job he will shut the mouth of the enemies in your neighborhood and the people in your house those fake relatives who act like they like you one minute but behind your back they're swinging swords and stabbing you a thousand times god will shut the mouth of your enemies the Bible said he went in and God shut the mouth of the lion. And the next day, the king, he didn't know what was going on. He stayed afar off because he was scared. And he shouted. He said, oh, Daniel, oh, Daniel, because he couldn't sleep that night because he, he thought, oh, God, please, Daniel's God, please save him. The Bible said he didn't sleep. And the next day, the Bible said he peeked around the corner like he didn't want to go because he was scared. And he said, oh, Daniel, oh, Daniel, did your God deliver you? Did your God? And Daniel shouted back and said, oh, king, live forever. And the king was so happy. And guess what he did? Those same enemies that caused him to sign that law. Oh, mighty God. The Bible said he sent and got them, their children, all of the household and threw them in the lion. And guess what? The lion ate them. That's what's going to happen to your enemies. In Daniel chapter 11, I'm going to read verse 12. And this is from one of Daniel's prayer and fasting. He was praying and fasting before God because he needed God's help. He needed an answer from God. And so watch this in verse 12. It says, um... Oh, no, I, I can't start at verse 12 because the angels came. La, 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 la. All right. Let me see, because I don't want to read too much, but it says, and he said unto him, oh, Daniel, a man greatly beloved. This is chapter 10. A man that's greatly beloved. This is the angel speaking. He said, beloved, understand the words that I speak unto you and stand. He told him to stand upright. I am now sent. And he said, then he said, he, he said unto me, fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that you prayed, from the first day that you prayed and set your heart to understand and chasten yourself. Chasten yourself is another way for saying fasting because you, you mortify, you're killing your flesh, you know, with the fast. He says, and you chasten yourself before God. Your words were heard and I am come for thy word. Mighty God, I want you to hear that. The angels came and said, Daniel, from the first day that you set yourself to seek Almighty God, God sent us out to you from the first day. So you don't have to fast 40 days, but if God tells you to fast 40 days, you fast 40 days. You see, if God tells you to fast three days, three days, but this 
angel said from the first day his knees hit the ground and he chastened himself that they god heard the words and god sent him because of the prayer of daniel which was fueled and powered by the fasting i'm showing you in the old testament fasting in the old testament now let's get on to the new testament the new testament we we go into the book of acts again i'm talking about fasting i'm showing you examples i'm showing you that fasting has power fasting is the the fuel it's the dunamis the i want to call it dynamite power and i'm telling you you have to go back to praying and fasting together when you want the power to ignite oh mighty god i'm, I'm closing in a minute but let's go to acts chapter 13 before I get to, well, let's do Acts chapter 13. And it says in chapter 13 in the book of Acts, verse, verse 3. And it says, and I read this last week, and it says, And when they had fasted, and when they had fasted, they laid their hands on them, and they sent them away. So they, being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, departed unto Seleucia, and from thence they sailed to Cyprus. So here in the book of Acts, uh, the um, Paul and, and Barnabas were called by the Holy Spirit. How? Because the disciples at the time, they went into fasting and prayer, asking God who to send asking God who to send and now in the New Testament the Holy Spirit speaks to us in the Old Testament the angels would come and speak or God would speak through the prophet to give them the answer now we have God on the inside through Jesus Christ he lives on the inside of us that's why when you were growing up they would tell you receive Jesus in your heart see when you pray and you fast and you study the word you begin to hear God in your spirit it's not spooky and it's not scary but you've got to get to know it. You know how people say, I got a hunch. Or they say, something told me not to go that way. And you know, when I didn't go that way, when I looked on the news, I saw there was a big car pile up, an 18-wheeler, crushed two cars. And one of those cars would have been me if I didn't follow that something that told me not to go that way. Well, that something, baby, is the Spirit of God in you. Every man was born with the Spirit of God. Some of them deny him, and that's all right, because you deny him in the judgment, he's going to deny you. But the Spirit of God, God is in the, the Bible said the spirit of man is the candle of the Lord. Ha ha. So the, the spirit of God is in every one of us. God blew his breath in you. And so they prayed, they fasted and they prayed. It says, and when they had fasted and prayed and they laid hands on them, God confirmed that these two were supposed to go over here. In, in Acts chapter 14, again, and in the book of Acts, you're going to see a lot of prayer and fasting. That's what they did throughout the book of Acts. Now, in the book of Acts, you saw the many miracles. You saw the miracles to the point where the Bible said the shadow, the shadow of the apostle would heal the sick people on the side of the road because they could not get to him. Everybody wanted a touch. Everybody wanted him to lay hands. But God, the power of God was so in him that his shadow would pass by and they would be healed. A lot of these tele-evangelists you see going, they, let me tell you something, talk about fake. These people, they don't fast and pray. They don't even know God. I don't want to get into that. I'm just saying. Acts chapter 14, verse 23, because they sensationalize this to get you to give your money. They sensationalize it and they put on these fake shows and people fall for it. And it's sad. And I'm going to preach against those things. I'm sorry. No, I'm not sorry. Acts 14, 23. And it says this. And when they had ordained them elders in the church and had prayed with, with fastings. I like how it puts it here. He said they prayed with fastings. They commended them unto the Lord on whom they believed. And after that, they passed throughout Pisidia and they came to Pamphylia. Mighty God. You see that? He says, 
And after they had prayed with, with fastings, with fastings, the power and the Holy Spirit of God spoke through them. And when you want to hear the voice of God, you have to silence your flesh. You have to quiet your mind. And when you are fasting, you bring your mind into control of the spirit and you bring your body into control, you see, and you can hear the voice of God. In 2 Corinthians, the apostle Paul was speaking and he says in weariness, in painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. This is why I said the shadow of the apostle would heal the sick. You see that? He said in fastings often. He was talking about his missionary journeys because remember, he was going about spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so he would go from country to country, city to city, place to place. And he met a lot of trouble. He was shipwrecked. He was bitten by a snake. He was beaten. He was put into jail. But what kept him going? We couldn't even go down the block and somebody spit on us. And man, we would get mad and call the police and we wouldn't want to go out the next day. We would tell God, sorry, but I'm hanging up the towel on this one, God. You got better find somebody else. And he went through all of this. And he said, how did I get through this? How did I get through the weariness? How did I get through the painfulness? How do I get through hunger and thirst? He says, in fasting, fasting often. He would fast and pray, fast and pray. When they were put in prison, he would begin to praise God because why? He fasted and prayed. He had a prayer life. And when he began to praise God in the prison, the Bible said they put them down in the dungeon, not the top level, but the bottom dungeon of the prison and he started to pray and the Bible said the chains fell off and the, the, the jail, the prison wall busted open and, and the angel came and escorted them out. God did that. That's why that um, singer she sing, um, break every chain, break every chain. God can break every chain in your life. Whatever addiction you have, if you have addictions to opioids, addiction to drugs, alcohol, cigarettes, God, pornography, God will break that chain, that demonic chain off of your life. Just go on a fast and pray and get the Bible and begin to read the promises of God to you because the fasting is that superpower that you need because you see when you fast you bring your body into obedience you force your body to say shut up and listen to God let me close because I'm telling you it's so sweet that I'm preaching instead of teaching but you get the point you see I want to close with this Daniel fasted daily and he prayed daily and when the problem arose it did not catch him off guard you see, you may not know what's coming down the pike. You don't have to know what's coming down the pike. But when you are in prayer and fasting, you won't be knocked off your feet. You won't be caught by surprise. You're like, oh, it's this. Oh, it's you. All right. You, you know, trouble comes. You see, prayer prepares while fasting anchors you. So prayer prepares you and the fasting anchors you because now you're not moving. Now both fists are up because now you're in a fight because you're at what? You've got superpower. Prayer prepares you and fasting will anchor you. And so you've got to pray like Daniel. He prayed three times a day. It doesn't mean you have to pray three times a day systematically, but you pray all the time. The apostle says, pray always with all prayer for all the saints everywhere. Pray without ceasing. The apostle would encourage throughout the epistles, Colossians, Philippians, and, and Ephesians, and Galatians. He said, pray, pray for me. He would say, pray, pray for the saints, pray for each other. Prayer is important. And when you add fast, now you got a superpower. But you see, most Christians, I'm closing, most Christians, they don't pray, they don't fast, they have no prayer life. So when trouble comes and they get bad news, they fall apart. And some Christians become suicidal over the pandemic, right into the beginning of the pandemic, there were even pastors and Christians committing suicide. It was devastating because we're like, no, 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 no. Great pastors would commit suicide. It was a thing. Christians were committing suicide. That's because you don't have a relationship with God. <clears throat> 
you don't have a prayer life. When you're in relationship with God, not that those things won't come into your flesh because your flesh is still the flesh. Oh, but when you get into prayer and fasting, that demon got to leave. You see, there are spirits out there that are real and they're after you. But when you fast and pray, you'll be anchored and you'll be prepared. So my friend, don't wait for trouble to come. Begin to fast, begin to pray, begin to ask God to guide you, strengthen you, Fast with a purpose. Ask him to strengthen you. Ask him to open your eyes. Ask him to give you understanding. Ask him to cleanse your spirit. Ask him to give you clarity and to send help. You can go to God with these things in fastings. Don't wait for trouble to come. Because you see, when you don't have a prayer life, you expect the pastor now to dig you out the pit. He can't do it by himself. She can't do it all by herself. You need to have faith. You need to also believe God when Jesus was always healing the sick notice the the the, the pattern and the, the undercurrent your faith has made you whole go my daughter your faith has made you whole oh I've never seen such great faith oh ye of little faith he always talks about having faith and you have faith when you believe in God that's why he told them in the book, Mark chapter 9, when they couldn't cast out the devil out, the demon out, that boy. And they said, you know, because you, it's unbelief. I'm tired of your unbelief. And he said, this goes away by prayer and fasting. Now, while you, people say there are different types of demons and you have to fast and pray and you have to be prepared before you lay hands to cast out demons because there is such a thing. You have to be fast. You can't just, you have to be anchored and you have to be prepared. But also to get rid of unbelief. You have to fast and pray too, because Christians are supposed to be believers, but Christians are the biggest group of unbelievers on the planet. Unbelieving Christians, because they cannot believe God's word. They will believe that they can go to work, work for two weeks, and the boss gives them the paycheck. But if God says, believe my word, believe my promises, that by my by the stripes of Jesus, you're healed, or believe that I will provide... We can't believe. We just like, oh, and we worry. So, beloved, begin to think about fasting. I want you to share this video with your friends. Sound the alarm. I'm coming back. We're going to stop right there. The next series, we're going to talk. The next uh, module, we're going to talk about the benefits of fasting and fasting in vain. Oh, yes. Now we're going to roll up our sleeves and get dirty because some people, they fast and they're fasting in vain because God is not listening. Remember what I said? God is not mocked. What a man sows, he's reap. He's going to reap. So you can't come to God any which way thinking you can fast and tell God, oh, yeah, I'm fasting because I don't like Sister Sharon and, and, and move her out the way. You can't fast and tell God to move somebody out the way. It don't work like that. That's witchcraft, honey. That's on the other side. But we're going to show you. So we're going to talk about the benefits of fasting and fasting in vain. So stay with the series. You are going to be blessed. Share it with others. And then after we do that, we're going to talk about the do's and don'ts of fasting, where Jesus tells us just how to do it and what not to do. And then we're going to talk about the different ways of fasting and the different types of fasting. So stay with the lesson. I hope you enjoyed it. I enjoyed it too. Thank you so much for watching. Share the video. And if you didn't subscribe, hit that subscribe button and let me know that you're watching by liking the video. So go with God and continue to be a blessing because you are blessed to be a blessing. Thank you for watching.